Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jacqueline Dorsey of Lean Frontiers and I'll serve as your host today. I'm excited to bring to you today a short webinar called Accounting Activities for the Lean Transformation facilitated by Gene Cunningham and J Jim Huntsinger. Jim, the president and founder of Lean Frontiers, will be serving as an MC and asking questions presented by our listeners. Jean, who will be sharing her insights, is the president and founder of Jean Cunningham Consulting and the co-author of two books awarded the Shingo Prize for Research. Please note that this session is being recorded if you want to refer back to it later. So for now, let me turn things over to Jim. Hey, thank you, Jacqueline, and uh, thank you, Jean, for being here. And good afternoon, everyone. Well, I guess good afternoon in some places and good morning in others. Yet. Um, so we'll get started here to get into the conversation discussion, and Gina, just to kind of kind of lead things off, um, just ask you a real kind of a basic but overarching question: Is why why should organizations um, do a lean transformation? Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, Jim and, and Jacqueline. It's really nice to be with you guys, and and hello to the folks that are on the webinar. Um, uh, I, there's nothing I like talking about better uh, than lean, and certainly lean in accounting. So, what this when I was asked to do this, I was sort of you know, readily interested in, in doing it. Um, I think that um, w when we think about why should we de do lean, there's kind of uh, answers at three levels. I mean, the first question really is why is there even lean? And, you know, I always come back as a financial person is that why did we study Toyota to understand what they were doing? And I find the, you know, information, the data that shows how in 2000 and before uh, that, how Toyota had completely outstripped the automotive industry in terms of market capitalization relative to their volume. And so I think every company is interested in a top leader in their industry to say, gee, what do they do that makes them perform so well and so attractive? And I mean, every company that I go around to has smart people, people that are interested, people that are trying to do their best at work and to make their companies be successful, their strategy, there's initiatives, but somehow Toyota was doing something different and so by studying Toyota to figure out well, how the heck did they, you know, how were they having such, you know, amazing results is really why there's lean at all. And, and you know, academic researchers uh, looking at them to find out what happened. So I think that's the first level is, you know, copying and uh, copying is not the right word, but learning from somebody who so outstrips their industry is uh, something probably fairly smart to do. Um, and then at another level, why lean is, um, you know, at the at the level of, you know, if the traditional ways of hierarchical management focused internally serves you really well as a company then well you know sort of go for it but most of us found that we were just never seeing the kind of uh, improvement results that we would like to see in our companies uh, and so we said well let's try to you know do something different and what I I feel like this something different is is a dramatic difference. It's a really an external focus as a uh, as a company from the customer perspective, and then on an internal perspective, it's not on you know do I have the greatest you know CEO or executive in place, but what am I doing to capture the genius of all the people that work in the company? And then at the third level, you know, why lean for me personally? Um, I just, as CFO of a, of a smaller, medium to small size company that was a fantastic company but that was struggling, it was the thing that made just the most sense and allowed us to have a dramatic, rapid improvement in the utilization of all of our human as well as capital resources. So it's just a, it's, it just makes sense at, at every level in my opinion. Okay, well, good. Well, that's a good breakdown and, and helpful to, uh, to kind of get an understanding. But let's, let's, let's take that on a step further then, and I guess I'll ask, why then a, uh, an accounting transformation in this regard? 
Yeah, I mean, that's really a, such an important follow-on question. I mean, it's, you know, when, when I was, um, again, I have to answer the question at, at different levels, but I'll start with the personal in this case. Um, I was CFO of this company, and, you know, I would stand up in front of the, we had a, you know, we, we were doing a lot of great things. We had a, a monthly meeting with all employees to share how we were doing, and I would get up to talk about the financial part, and all I could talk about was mix, and, you know, it was boring and it was uninteresting and, it, and I was speaking a foreign language at the front of the room and I didn't like it. It felt wrong. It felt uh, uncomfortable. But then when we began to apply lean thinking throughout the organization, which was all about, you know, a lot of engagement of people at all levels, well, then it made even less sense to talk a language that no one could understand. and. Um, so we, we needed to do something different. The other thing that um, accounting needed to be engaged is that because as we were changing our thinking about how we initially produced product, um, a couple of things happened that made our the way we had looked at manufacturing before from a standard cost accounting perspective make no sense whatsoever. And the two things really were, first of all, Standard cost accounting, of course, reward, rewards uh, and gap rewards making as much as possible. And so we were dramatically saying, no, we're not going to make what we can. We're going to make what is needed based on customer demand. And so our measurement system was giving, you know, positives for the wrong behavior and negatives for the right behavior. And that could, that just wasn't sustainable and didn't make any sense to provide the wrong measures. And then the other part of it was when we went away from batch sizes, larger batch sizes, any kind of activities for data collection uh, made no sense because we were creating so many transactions as we went from large batches to one piece flow that the transactional level you know, didn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah. So accounting really has to follow and support the they change the way a company does business, not not uh, lead it in that regard. Yeah. Okay. Well, then with that, and what would be the what would be the first thing you would recommend someone to change or look into in transforming um, from you know I guess traditional methods in in accounting for a manufacturing company into you know I guess what we term lean accounting. Sure. Uh, I think of lean accounting as uh, two main components. One component is what I call accounting for lean. In other words, what are the changes to the financial and management accounting, uh, financial the statements as well as the metrics that more align with how you're trying to operate. The other part of lean accounting is how can we take in the accounting operations the same concepts that we're applying in manufacturing or in other parts of the office to the accounting itself. So in terms of accounting for lean, I think that we need, the first steps would be to get very engaged with operations, accounting people to get very engaged. Go be on the shop floor in the operational areas, see how they're actually changing and what information would support the changes that they're making um, so that you can make sure you're getting rid of metrics and reporting that is not useful um, especially with the new ways of doing business. In terms of lean for accounting, I really think the best place to start is looking at your monthly close process. It's, yeah. the, it's the best place to start in that regard. Okay. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned just some different measures. Can you give some examples of what these differences or changes in performance measures might be or uh, people would consider or need to consider, actually, I guess? Sure, of course. Thank you. I think that you know the the um, the some of the you know high level metrics that make the most sense are things that you as you know I, hopefully a lot of businesses are looking at, but focusing more on on time delivery, reduced lead time, uh, and um, making sure that you're building building items in as small as batch as possible so that you can dramatically reduce work in process inventory, implementing pull and, and reducing work in process inventory. I think work in process inventory is probably um, 
one indicator that you're having success with some of your changes operationally as work in process inventory goes down. So measuring it as a subset of your overall inventory can be good. Um, I, I'm a big fan of just measuring how the improvement activity itself, especially when you're first getting started. So rather than focusing so much on the outcome of your improvement activity, first measure on a process measure of how much improvement activity you're actually doing. Um, because you can't expect different outcomes if you're not willing to, to actually change how you do things. Um, so I think those are, those are uh, quite good. Um, and, and I think that uh, and from a financial point of view, one of my very favorite overall metrics is uh, on the receivable side is yeah. what, how much are, of your receivables are not being paid exactly to your invoice. The reason I love this metric is because when customers don't pay the exact amount of your invoice, I'm not talking about customers who don't pay. I'm talking about customers who pay a different amount than the invoice you sent them. It's generally a reflection that you have upstream process defects. And this is one of the areas that I think accounting can really change how they support the rest of the operation is because we have a lot of information in accounting that points the direction to process problems upstream and yet we don't look at it or share it that way and think about um, what how it's pointing to upstream uh, process defects. Good. You, you mentioned you certainly some of those uh, that you mentioned aren't what we typically think of traditionally when we think about um, account, you know, accounting. Um, you know, traditionally like a you know variance, uh, cost variance, and other standard cost and all that. Um, so, what what is, what is the role for things like uh, we traditionally measure like standard cost or variances and all that? How do those play in or not play in? Well, I, I think they're just a they're they're. they're they're subterfuge. I mean, they, they hide what's really going on. They're, they're just not meaningful metrics whatsoever um, in a, the, the, a business that is implementing value streams and flow and pull in the factory and in their operations. I mean, those words don't mean anything. In fact, I think, Jim, you were one of my best teachers in, in sharing with, with me the origins of standard cost accounting and how it came from a product development perspective with the explicit warning that standard cost yeah. accounting should not be used to measure manufacturing performance. So clearly it is, a, 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 it is one of the very worst things that you can be using uh, to help support your lean transformation. It, it just keeps you stuck in the past. Yeah. And so, if you've got it, if you feel like as an accounting person, you just have to do standard cost accounting for some reason, or your company's too big to change really quickly, well, at least quit, you know, sending it out as part of management accounting. Just keep it in your accounting office and do whatever you got to do with it. But you know, it's not going to help your management run the company. Well, that, that's a great point. So if so, if we shouldn't, sounds like, and obviously I agree with you, shouldn't do standard <laughs> costing, but we want to do costing for our uh, products. What uh, what's our option then? Sure, sure, good, good question. Well, I think what's really um, valuable is to um, make sure that as you align your cost structure to be along with products. So as you move towards value streams that are product based, you're going to be dedicating more and more of your resources to a value stream. So already you've got a cost pool. Letting go of what, what do we think the cost of this individual SKU is, but more in these value stream product groupings. What are the costs that support that grouping? And then for the truly variable costs, costs like of course the rent or elements like the revenue, maybe discounts, allowances, materials, things that truly vary with volume. Yes, we can know those at the SKU level and through a bill of material, for example. And then we can really look at costs that do vary by volume at the product item level and look at costs that are really manage, management decisions, labor, utilities, scrap, etc. Look at those at the product grouping level. 
I see. Um, what what are some of the things you in doing that? Would you suggest you that people do um, to increase cost awareness through these uh, you know accounting activities in, in a lean environment? Sure. Well, I think we should just initially really focus on material content because material content for most of the companies that I uh, am engaged with and work with is the is the really the largest cost element. Um, in the company, and yet it's the least information about it. I one of the favorites that I've always had that we can do in accounting is to, you know, just just you know where that you have materials out on the shop floor or in in stock areas. Go ahead and put what is the cost of that product there. Begin to educate people about the cost elements for the items that we're already buying. Now it's a totally different story, however, if you're talking about product development. In product development, this is really where the entire cost structure of the future of your company really is defined because they are the ones that are defining materials, specifications, processes, and I think that we in accounting could be much, much better partners in product development up where the really critical decisions are being made to be part of that process and to get started there I just encourage accounting people go get on a product development team just start being on one of the product development activities in your company just start going with no agenda and I can assure you that you're going to be pulled in there's going to be a lot of questions about areas where they would like your help in understanding cost structures and cost information because our cost information and our financial information has been shrouded in mystery for so many years most people don't understand you know what the information available really means that's a, that's a, yeah that's a, that's an excellent point because yeah it's uh, typically again depending on your industry and, and type of product and all that what do they say typically somewhere between 70 90 percent of the cost in a sense are fixed in the life cycle of a product, um, you know, once you go through the product and process development and get it launched, so you're after that you're somewhat limited on what what all you can do. So you're right about trying to get that up up front. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a huge. I think it's just a huge opportunity. And I I, I um, you know, what if we could really take our thinking of value add and non value add, which are some of the core thinking of um about how we look at the activities and, and uh, of our companies and we could apply it just to the material content of our products. I think yes. we really, you know, we look so in a detailed way at labor, you know, and, and we look at, you know, what are people doing down to the minute, you know, it's labor. One of the, you know, costs that is the the easiest to manage, I guess, uh, in some sense, and yet we don't look at all at you know some of the more strategic material costs or the processing methodology, or think even below gross margin. We're always looking above gross margin, and yet where are some of our most expensive investments that we make? Salespeople, R and D, and we rarely look at the information. Uh, unfortunately, for many companies, that's below gross margin. Yeah, good point. So, a dollar's a dollar, regardless of where we accountants put it on the income statement. Absolutely. <laughs> well, we're looking at accountants. So uh, another question, uh, and a lot of these questions, majority of these questions I'm going through are ones that were submitted by people that uh, uh, that are attending. Is um, you know, what's what's some of the best ways to help make accountants? Um, understand lean that's that it's a good thing and it can be applied to them as well I suppose really I guess maybe some of the uh, lean accounting activities versus maybe the accounting for lean you've talked about some of the accounting for lean activities are there some good lean accounting activities that accountants could use for themselves yes that's a great question and um, I'm gonna answer it a couple levels well first of all there is no question that the Lean Accounting Summit, I'm going to do a huge plug for Lean Frontiers, Lean Accounting Summit is a great way for people that are like, what is this Lean Accounting and, and really does it apply to me? It is a great opportunity to go and hear real people in real companies talk about what they've done, hear some of the thought leaders, rub elbows with people. It's a very you know, anonymous way to do it. You don't have to embarrass yourself in front of people at your company that think you're a, 
you know, such a guru that you don't have to learn. <laughs> but go to the Lean Accounting Summit, or if you can't go, you know, I know uh, Lean Frontiers has other products to hear what some of the speakers and things have to say. So, so I think that's really important. Um, and then, of course, I'll plug Real Numbers, uh, Management Accounting for a Lean Organization. I think it has lots of great examples of yes. the two parts of um, that Ori Fume, who is a CFO at Wiremold, and I wrote together to describe some of it. And then I think, then I think it's really the next thing that you can do is you can. Um, you know, just start to go to some of the activities outside of accounting. Maybe it's in order entry, or maybe it's in the purchasing area, or maybe it's in shipping, and have a couple of people from accounting. Just go be participants on those teams and start to think about the improvements that they made in that area. How do, do we have those kinds of processes in accounting? Do we, do we have you know, processes. Well, yeah, we pay bills. That's a process. We collect money. That's a process. We close the books. That's a process. And start to see what it feels like in somebody else's neck of the woods so that, that they can start to see how it might feel in their neck of the woods. Sometimes people have a hard time if they just go to a factory to look at it because they have a hard time bridging what it, what it really means. But believe me, that's how I started. And I couldn't be any more passionate or more committed to the understanding that lean thinking applies in every industry and in every part of the company and absolutely within accounting. Yeah, that's, that's a great point because that's, uh, that's why there's a lot of work to get done be, um, going through the trans transformation because you do need to touch every aspect of the business. Yes. Zoom in a little bit here on some uh, maybe more specific things. Um, if you could maybe explain, you, you talked about some of this a little bit already, but maybe a little more detail about what are, what are um, what sort of um, cash flow statements um, you see being shared amongst managers within lean companies in order to communicate information. Is there some differences in that for, for a lean enterprise? Well, I think I think that um, the if if you're trying to create a culture of engagement. And you don't share the scorecard. It's not fair, you know. If you say, "Bring your whole self, create this culture, apply your genius. We want your help, but oh, we're not going to tell you what the outcome of that is." I think those are just incompatible with each other. So I think it's absolutely important to share the as as much information as people can tolerate. Um, starting in little bits of, you know, what is the demand for the products? What's the basic cost structure of the product? Um, wh what, is the, what is the amount of resources we have dedicated in different areas? Which types of products? I mean, here's one that I think is an easy one to share. A lot of employees don't know which products are really important in your company. I was at a company yeah. this this week. and. You know, this one area was being asked to work a lot of overtime, and you know there was a little bit of uh, uh, uh but then they said, "Don't you realize that your the product you work on has the highest demand and growth right now, and it's saving us because another product's low?" The whole demeanor of the people on the team were like, "Really? We're that important? Yes, you're that important." Sharing the scores, sharing what's going on, I think is. It's, it's just a form of respect for people. Good. And carrying on with that, are there, are there any other types of uh, accounting reports or approaches that you would uh, recommend that are beneficial, maybe more specific, specifically for trying to identify problem areas that you've used? I, I, um, I really do like um, uh, sharing information. Well, first of all, of course, if you have uh, the ability to create value stream um, in, uh, management accounting statements, which is one of the things we talk about a lot with lean accounting. I think that's you know extremely valuable. The other thing, though, that can be as equally, if not as valuable, is to have um, readily available statements of key metrics. They can mm -hmm. include non-financial metrics as well as some financial metrics that business group, business teams. That are relevant to the work that they do. You know, not just some, about somebody else's work at the high, highest level of the company. But let's say I'm a, let's say I'm well. Let's pick an accounting department. I'm an accounting department, 
what is the key things that I can really make a difference in? Maybe you have a strategy of increasing the enough amount of electronic uh, invoicing or electronic receipt activity. Well, how much is it? And have a metric. Are we getting better or not? Maybe you, maybe you have a metric about, um, you know, maybe you're responsible for the tax rate in your company. Well, what is it? Maybe you have, what's the number of days that it takes to close the books? You know, these wouldn't just be financial information, but a mixture of financial and non-financial information that that team is really responsible for, um, for you know, improving. Uh, as you go through time. You know, what's the cost of our department? Um, and the other thing that I think accounting can do, um, I kind of touched on it earlier, is I think that we can do a better job of highlighting um, of the eight ways of lean, um, the defects being, you know, number one uh, waste in, in the, the waste, in my opinion, is I think accounting has a lot of information about where defects are happening upstream. We see yeah. it in but I fees, we see it in returns, we see it in, you know, price deviations, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that we could we could do a much better job of highlighting that information back to the organization so that they have an opportunity to focus better some of their um, improvement activities in areas that, that really do touch the customer as well as touch the financial performance of the company. Okay, good. I want, to, I want to circle back around something you, you talked somewhat on in regards to standard costing and you start talking about some value stream costing. Um, a question is, is what's that someone had was what's the best way to handle overhead costs when determining cost savings? And I'm assuming that's in a term of uh, probably, you know, looking at doing things differently in terms of value stream costing. How do you handle that? Okay, so um, so many different choices, and you know it's such a big question. But let me let me um, let me give you my sort of guidelines. First of all, I wouldn't, I don't like, I don't think it's a good idea to mix costs that uh, in three areas. I don't like mixing variable costs that vary with volume with costs that don't vary with volume, and within your costs that don't vary with volume, I don't like mixing costs that are specific to a value stream versus costs that are shared. So, so at least that you could see what are the, you know, the, the, in those big buckets. And so if I have a cost that is shared by all value streams, so for instance, I have a plant management, maybe I have um, advertising, maybe I have a shipping dock or a paint line, well, those costs might support all of my value streams depending on the size of the company. And so you want to have um, somebody responsible for those cost areas through, I mean, I love our cost center structures. Use cost centers for those areas. Give them accountability for managing, you know, their, their um, investment of resources and, and um, improvement efforts. And then at a higher level, if you choose to allocate those costs to the, back to the value streams, at least keep it on a separate line. So it, you can really see this is an allocated cost and allocated at a very high level. So those are some of the things that I suggest doing. That's good. That's helpful. Well, we're, we're almost to our target time, so let me maybe ask one more question as, as maybe kind of a wrap-up here before we end, end our time with Eugene. And, um, uh, the question is, what are some of the um, common roadblocks folks will run into uh, is a venture down this and you know maybe some some uh, a brief response on what they should do about those roadblocks okay um, well I think first of all um, the the one of the roadblocks is if I don't do what I'm doing now with my let's just take cost reporting in, in particular if I don't do what I'm doing right now what will I be doing I think people's un inability to imagine or, or think about what they would do if they're not doing what they're doing right now is a big barrier for all kinds of changes in every kind of area. So just lack of an idea of what the future would hold for them personally. Um, and what to do about it would be to just take some baby steps, right? Don't churn the yeah. world in one, you know, in one stroke. Just take some baby steps, do some things off to the side, you know, like Ori, um, my co-author on Real Numbers talks about how initially with their changes and what they did, he, he sort of did a side set of state, you know, reports and sent those out, 
and eked into it. I, we went a little bit more, you know, whole hog <laughs> right away. But I, but I think that, um, you know, it's very, with clients and things, I see a real interest in, you know, yeah. what might this look like analytically before I actually go and change my systems. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. Um, yeah. The other thing is, is that um, one of the areas of, of challenge with the cost structure stuff is um, we use the cost to price our product and um, what I find is generally what people are saying is not that they use it to price their product they are just use it as a last check to make sure that they're not going to price their product too low um, and so I think if you can get the way to get beyond that is to understand that you can still have some analytical um, you know, uh, uh, estimations and, and uh, just like a standard cost is an estimation that doesn't have to be run through your accounting system that you can use uh, based on the times that you actually do pricing, which when you really get down to it, you don't make a lot of pricing decisions every day anyway. So, you know, just the, you know, why, 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 five whys, why do you need the information, keep, keep asking that to really get down to that root cause so that you can find a solution that's more manageable. Okay, great. Thank you, Gene. And we're, we're at our target time, so we will wrap it up. And again, thank you so much, Gene, for sharing your insight and experience. It's always great to hear and always very beneficial. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening in today. And with that, I will throw it back to Jacqueline. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jim and Gene, uh, for facilitating our session today. As um, Jean mentioned earlier, if you're interested in learning more on this subject, Jean will be speaking at the Lena Accounting Summit held in San Antonio on August 25th through the 26th. To learn more, please visit www.leanaccountingsummit.com. We also want to offer a special discount code for everyone tuning in today to receive uh, a discount off of the Lena Accounting Summit, please use the discount code WEBINAR for 10% off the summit price. Again, that's WEBINAR for 10% off the summit price, also listed on the PowerPoint that you can see. Um, so to wrap up, I wanted to remind you all that today's webinar is being recorded, so look for an email following our time together for a link to the recording. And feel free to share this throughout your organization. So again, thank you, Jim, and thank you, Jean. And thanks to each of you for participating in today's session. Goodbye.